Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for participating in this uh, IDA lecture. It's the last one of this year. It was a very productive year. We had uh, a large number of uh, lectures that have been delivered. Today, the lecture is going to be delivered by Professor Marius Polikarpou from uh, the University of Cyprus. Uh, he's a very well-known scientist. He's uh, a head of the U.S. Research and Innovation Center of Excellence at the University of Cyprus. He is also a member of the Cyprus Academy of Sciences, and he's a honorary professor of the Imperial College. Uh, the topic of uh, his lecture is uh, how to intelligently monitor and control uh, interconnected cyber physical systems, which is a very important topic because security is, an, is a very important issue nowadays. So, Professor Policarbo, you can, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, good afternoon, um, good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. Um, it's a great pleasure to give this IDA lecture, and, and uh, I would like to thank the Professor Pitas and the organizing team for the uh, kind invitation. Um, so, the, my presentation today uh, would be on, on the issues related to monitoring and control uh, related to interconnected cyber physical systems. So let's start with a little bit uh, in terms of motivation. And um, uh, uh, let's see, let's see why is it? Okay, so we, uh, we live in a smart revolution. We hear a lot about uh, smart this and smart that, smart phones, smart cars. Um, everything is smart, you know, the energy, the buildings, the cities, uh, the cameras, the, even the water is uh, smart these days. So you can think of, you know, this is uh, uh, kind of as smart, you can think of it as smart decks in terms of you know you can just uh, you can just add anything uh, uh, and to make it smart and and one of the questions that uh, it's important to ask is um, uh, are these really uh, are these systems really that smart and uh, so when when we talk about designing systems that are smart or intelligent uh, that's the other word that is used uh, widely um, I think it's kind of interest. It's kind of important to separate between the the hardware and the software. What do we need in order to be able to design systems that are intelligent? Um, so we need the software. We need uh, uh, sensing devices to be able to get information uh, and data. We need actuation devices so that we can change something in the system. Uh, we need the embedded computing in order to be able to make the systems. And then we also need a wide area connectivity. And I, did, I, I put this in, in, in dark blue because uh, for a lot, uh, for, for most part, this, um, the hardware part uh, is pretty advanced and is continuing to be developed. But to a lot, a lot of extent, we have what it takes to actually develop systems that are smart. Uh, of course, there's going to be uh, new. Uh, there's going to be new developments in the hardware area, but I think already we are in a pretty good position. When we come to software, in order to design something that is smart, we need uh, to be able to take the data, uh, store the data, manage the data then develop decision-making algorithms, um, learning algorithms, optimization and control. And, and I think even though we have developed a lot of uh, new algorithms in the last uh, five, 10 years, for example, we have uh, um, uh, deep learning and uh, neural networks and, and all different kinds of algorithms that uh, reinforcement learning. Um, I think to a large extent, uh, even though this, these developments are really impressive, I think we still have a long ways to go before we actually uh, can actually call these uh, smart uh, devices. So, um, so 
um, I think uh, uh, the digital advances uh, uh, provide the ICT infrastructure. Uh, however, they don't by the, themselves, they don't provide the intelligence. So, and in fact, the infrastructure will actually be enhanced even further in the next few years because of the full deployment of Internet of Things. So, uh, so we are actually at this, uh, in my opinion, even though these are, are, are called uh, smart devices and smart grids and so on, um, I think a more appropriate term for them is that they are smart ready. Of course, if you call the, the grid smart ready grid is not as uh, exciting as calling it smart grid or, or smart phones or smart cars. However, I think we still have uh, ways to go. And I think in this, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to discuss some of the things that need to be improved in order to be able to, uh, to make these systems really uh, to the level that we can call them uh, smart. And, and it's not a one or zero, of course. It's a, it's a, it's a continuum in terms of um, how we progress. However, it's, it's, uh, it's important to keep uh, that in mind. Uh, in order to do this, I think machine learning and feedback control systems are, are at the heart of transform, you know, going from smart uh, ready to smart. Um, I think these are the these are the methods that we need to because uh, machine learning provides the uh, the ability to learn uh, from experience and from new data. While feedback control gives you the uh, makes uh, helps you understand how the feedback can actually help you make uh, good decisions because it's not only being able to. Uh, understand what's going on is also being able to turn the data into smart decisions. Um, so in the last few years, we talk, we, we hear a lot about cyber physical systems, and this is the thing that I will be uh, focused on. So cyber physical systems for most of you, you are familiar with it, uh, but for those of you that are not, uh, really, what they are is systems that consist of a physical part. Uh, so the physical part could be biological or engineering systems, or 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 a, um, or a power plant, or or water. You know that are usually large scale and complex. And and there's the cyber component, which is the communication network, the computational resources, the algorithms. Um, uh, which are to allow you to do monitoring control and so on. So these are, this is a cyber physical system. And, and to a large extent, this has been, uh, it's, it has been a smooth transition from more traditional systems that we had 10, 20 years ago because of new sensor technologies, new information communication technologies that allowed us to actually have this data and communicate this data in order to be able to make real-time decisions. And, and when I talk about sensor technologies and things like that, it, we don't think of only of traditional sensors, uh, but also of, uh, you know, our, our phones have a lot of sensors, our smartwatches have uh, sensors, uh, even, even the social media provides information about what's going on, or we can have mobile robots that move around, get information, and this information can be transmitted. So, so these are you know, examples of cyber physical systems, and these cyber physical systems uh, are actually in the, are progressing um, uh, more and more with the uh, more the with the deployment of Internet of Things, which uh, is it's the ability to be able to you know go to the store, uh, buy some some sensors almost off the shelf, and be able to uh, connect these devices and get information, transmit the information uh, in order to be able to. Uh, help you make decisions or to help you monitor a certain scenario. So these uh, Internet of Things devices, it's a, it's an industry that is progressing um, 
very fast and at, at a very uh, at an exponential rate. And I think this is something that uh, uh, being able to uh, have all these devices on the internet and being able to have this information is going to open up new opportunities, uh, as we will see. So let's take some examples of large scale interconnected cyber physical systems. So everybody's familiar with the smart grid. So this consists of uh, different components like uh, uh, integrating renewables, uh, you know, the, the hardware behind it. And, and how do you actually design such systems so that we are ready for the next uh, stage, you know, for uh, electric cars and so on. So this is an area that people in the energy and power systems are paying a lot of attention, but not only, and a lot of other people as well. We have smart buildings, which have different components uh, for security, for our comfort and so on. The, I, again, these are examples of buildings that, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, the building, is, you know, it's, uh, I think one of the common commonalities that we can see in the technology is that they are moving. So the buildings in the past, we can think of them as, as walls, you know, and civil engineers were dealing with it. How do you build the walls in order to, uh, in order to have some uh, certain properties and to be stable? Nowadays, the electronics inside the, the smart buildings is a big part of what's going on. And, and you know, the electronics are used for energy consumption, for lighting, for fire uh, uh, detection and so on, for, for our comfort, for the HVAC systems, the water system. And it's the same with, the, you know, with smart cars. And so uh, that's actually my next example, uh, intelligent transportation, that's another area that you know, the electronics is becoming a big part of what's, uh, of what's going on. So cars used to be, you know, 95% mechanical and um, maybe only the lights and so on were uh, electrical, but uh, nowadays most cars are maybe half and half and pretty soon will be, a, will be completely electronics, electrical and electronics. So, so you can see this trend going on and, and, uh, and this is another large scale system. So the, the algorithms in there actually uh, make a big difference. And so another example of a cyber physical system is multi-robot uh, formation. And if you go to a larger scale, uh, you can think of smart cities. That's an area that a lot of people are working on where you have a network of interconnected cyber physical systems. And once you have at that level, then you have, in addition to the physical interconnections and the cyber interconnections, who communicates with whom, you also have the interdependencies. If something was to go wrong in one subsystem, that affects another system. So, uh, so um, something that we didn't have to think about because these, uh, these systems were actually quite decentralized, now they are depending on each other. And we see something going wrong in one uh, part of the, in one part of the network affecting other things. So we want to be able to understand this so that we can, we can handle it and make good decisions. Um, when, when, I, when we talk about these issues, uh, I, you know, especially with uh, young, um, young uh, students and young researchers, I, I like to point out some of the things that are coming in the future in terms of, uh, in terms of jobs. So, you know, according to the World Economic Forum, uh, in the next few years, a lot of, of current jobs will actually be, become obsolete because of some of the new technologies that are being developed because people are not uh, you know, the workers are not needed. And this is not something new, it's something that started with, you know, factories, automated factories and so on. However, with the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, and all these things that we are discussing today, 
a lot of the things can be done uh, even at the cognitive level. They can be done in a in a in a better in a better way uh, by algorithms. So uh, so this is something that a lot of people are are um, concerned about policymakers and and so on. On the other hand. Uh, according to, to these experts, of course, these are predictions, nobody really knows if they will come true or not, but these jobs will actually be replaced by even more jobs that, but they are in specific areas, and these areas of AI and machine learning and uh, big data analytics, robotics, uh, cloud computing, and so on, are the jobs that are needed in order to, for the future. So. One of the things that I like to, to tell my students is that they are actually at the right place at the right time, because, you know, this is, you know, if, if they know how to do some of these things, there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of demand for it. Uh, and, and I think this is very important as you, as you study hard to keep in mind where the future is going. So, uh, so the area of cyber physical systems, of course, consists of many different components and, and uh, the technological trend is to actually, for the systems to actually become more complex and large scale, more interconnected and more automated. And uh, so this is, these are the current uh, trends. Um, so we don't deal with, you know, we don't try to solve small problems anymore. We try to solve the big problems, which are the, the most complex one. Um, however, one of the things that I want to bring to the attention, which is one of the topics of this presentation, is that if the data that we are getting um, is it's faulty in some sense, it's because the sensor is faulty or because the actuator is not working like it should or is inconsistent or missing, this actually may lead to wrong decisions or escalation into a catastrophic failure. And, and because of these systems being a lot more interconnected than they were 20 years ago, um, if something was to go wrong, then there's a higher probability that uh, unless we do something about it, that it would be propagate from one subsystem to another. And of course, if that happens and, you, and, and it does happen, uh, for example, in, in uh, in 2006, there was a small um, uh, there was a small fault at the at the, at the a power a power system in Germany, which was not detected and addressed in 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 time, and it actually propagated all the way to Spain. So the, so a lot of people went. Um, uh, there was a, a big blackout, which actually it didn't start so big. It, it ended up uh, being very big, but in the beginning it was like a small thing that actually propagated. Of course, if something was to start in Cyprus, which is uh, it's an island and it's not connected, the energy system is not connected to any other country. I mean, they're talking about connecting it, but still it's isolated. It's not going to propagate very far, it's hardly going to propagate within the country, but, it, but the trend is to have more interconnections and more large scale systems and more automation. So we need to deal with this because if something was to go wrong, then this, uh, if we lose trust in the, in the automation procedure, then, um, then that's, a, that's an issue because a, a lot of it is automated. So we need to trust it and, 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 and to be reliable. So, the, so this trend uh, is actually because of, uh, uh, of the interconnections, the automation and the complexity of the system, it actually makes the systems more fragile. So we need to develop algorithms that are actually able to prevent uh, and make them, and, and this, is, uh, this is a big part of of having a smart uh, cyber physical system. So one of the things that uh, we are working on, that I'm working on with, uh, with my colleagues and, uh, and, uh, and other researchers uh, is the development, uh, with, it's kind of the vision that I have of a lifelong intelligent condition monitoring system, which 
actually monitors the condition of a system during its lifetime, from the beginning of its lifetime to the end of its lifetime. And it's using learning to improve condition monitoring. So it's using learning techniques. It's cooperating with others in order to improve condition monitoring and, um, and to be able to handle realistic events, uh, not only very simple uh, faults, but also more, uh, more difficult faults like slowly developing faults or cybersecurity attacks and so on. Um, so, you know, you can think of it, you know, just like uh, humans, we go to the doctor, you know, for regular checkups um, and uh, unless we are sick and then we go to the doctor, uh, you can think of the system actually has, you know, with the sensing capabilities and the, and the information that we have, it's like being able to monitor the, uh, the condition of the system for actually uh, for all the time. And uh, so, of course, how do you, you know, how do you handle uh, this situation? What, how, what can you do with it? But, uh, uh, you know, with the wide deployment of sensing devices, you can actually uh, think about having uh, the ability to uh, monitor for, a, for, a, for, a, for the whole life of it, uh, but it still needs to be done. So when we talk about monitoring and control, uh, monitoring is the ability to take uh, information about the input and the output of the system. Sometimes the input is not available, but uh, let's assume that it is um, uh, because of proprietary information. Sometimes, for example, uh, the people don't tell you the, the controller is already incorporated into the system, so you don't have that information. But most of the times you do. So, and being able to monitor uh, how, how well the system is behaving and, and to be able to detect and diagnose when something is wrong. So, so that's the monitoring part. The control part is the one that actually has feedback. And once you have feedback, that gives you a lot, a lot, of, uh, a lot of capabilities because you can actually change things. It's not, you know, the monitoring, you just, you just, uh, you just get data and you're not actually changing the system, but in the, in the control, because you're using, you actually are able to change the behavior of the system. And, and that gives you a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of power. On the other hand, it could also be a problem because if you don't choose it well enough, it could actually make things worse. It, is not, it can go both ways. It can, it can go uh, in a positive way or in a negative way. And uh, um, so, so this is the control part. Uh, you know, this is, a, uh, is something that uh, people in electrical engineering, for example, are, are, is a standard course. However, some people in computer science, some people working in machine learning may not be familiar with some of this concept because, you know, the feedback loops are very important in many different components. I mean, even in biological systems, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of interest to understand these feedback loops because they are very important. But a lot of times we use, we design the feedback loops in order to make the system behave in a way that we want. Uh, for example, there's, the, you know, feedback loop is very important part of robotic systems, of power systems, of, uh, of um, uh, vehicles and so on. If you combine the two, then you can actually use information from monitoring to actually uh, make modifications. That's uh, that's usually called fault accommodation in the controller. So this is, a, you know, this is a, you can think of this as a monitoring and control system that has this component as well. So the um, um, so when we talk about faults. Uh, uh, what is, the, what is it that can go wrong into the system? So let's think about this. Um, the, for one thing, uh, something inside the system can actually go wrong. So this is usually called a system or process fault um, or something in the actuator could go wrong. So we usually we have, you know, for a large complex system, we may have 10, 20 actuators and at any one time, it's possible that one of them or two of them are not 
doing what the controller is telling them to do. So the controller is an algorithm. It, tell, it sends a command and something needs to change. It's usually, for a, not usually, but it's quite common uh, to have like a, a, a motor affecting, uh, to rotate something, to change something. Uh, and uh, you know motors do fail after you know after um, if, if they're in the sun or after uh, many years of operation. And if you don't know that they are failing because they don't you know they don't raise their hand and say look I have failed. You know they they do something, but you what you have is you have sensor information. But even sensors can fail. You know you can have a hundred sensors and at any one time five or ten of them are giving you wrong information. And we're not talking about noise. That's related to robustness. Um, you know, uh, that's also a very important thing. So we're designing robust systems, but we're talking about giving wrong information. And sometimes, of course, it's clear that the sensor is not working. It's, it's not giving any information. But a lot of times, it, it, doesn't, it, does, it, it doesn't tell you that it's wrong information. It just, it just uh, um, it's just giving you an information which is not true. So it could be a bias fault, or it could be some other kind of fault, um, or a multiplicative fault, and so on. Uh, the other thing that could go wrong is the communication. So this is the communication. So a lot of times there's no wires these days, uh, you know, between the plant and the controller, or between the detection. Uh, and uh, and sometimes the communication um, is not working as, as it should. And there's a, other kinds of faults, controller faults, environment faults. But I, I like to emphasize the last one because I think it's very important. And it's something that has become important in the last few years. And that is actually malicious attacks. These are not regular faults. These are not something that happened uh, because you know, the, you know, been uh, operating the system uh, for many years, it's uh, something is to go wrong. But this is uh, this is an attack on the system. So these are, and this could be a physical attack. So someone can actually contaminate the water. You know, that's a physical attack, or it could be a cyber attack. The cyber attack. So the cyber security, it's it's a big uh, it's a big. Uh, it's a big issue and you know a lot of people um, believe that you know the wars of the future would be actually be related to cyber cyber um, cyber security attacks so it's 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 uh, you know if you if you attack the power grid of a certain country uh, that's a, that's a big issue I mean you don't you don't need to throw bombs you can just uh, do other things and and uh, so this is this is a big issue, and even though it's different, it's actually related. It's clear that it's related to to some of the other uh, faults that we talked about. Now, what are the steps? What are the you know what are the things that you want to to you want to be able to, when something goes wrong, you want to be able to detect it. Okay, so that's the a fault detection or event detection. Um, and a lot of the research has focused on that. In reality, this is, of course, the easiest part, uh, you know, but, you know, a, a much harder problem is actually be, especially in large scale system, is to be able to isolate the fault. You know, in other words, to find where is the fault, which sensors are faulty, which actuators are faulty, what type of fault is it? So that's the isolation part. Uh, Another thing which, uh, so very, you know, uh, there's been research, but not as much. Um, and an area where very little research has been done is actually in the area of risk assessment. If something is wrong, um, how, how big of a risk is it? Do I need to shut down the system or, or can I just wait until the next, uh, the next time that I go for maintenance in order to do it? So, that's the risk assessment. So you're actually asked to predict how the propagation of the event will happen. So that's the risk assessment. And finally, uh, using the feedback loop to actually make corrections 
at least temporarily, that's usually called uh, for the accommodation. So, okay, so it's a difficult problem. How do we handle it? Um, so the, uh, you know, intuitively, the way to handle it, um, of course, you can think in terms of, you know, the most simplistic way to think of it is if instead of having one sensor measuring a certain component, you have three sensors measuring exactly the same thing, same type of sensors, then you can just take the, the majority, you know, if they don't agree, you take, you know, the two of them. And this is called physical redundancy. Uh, this is not really, very practical, and you can maybe you can do it with some expensive, you know, with some inexpensive sensors, or you can do it for space applications where you know things are very critical. But you don't, you you cannot afford to do it. Uh, so the the approach that mostly is used is what is called analytical redundancy. You don't have a physical redundancy, but you use mathematical models or data to obtain uh, some information in order to be able to say whether uh, something is doing what it should be doing or not, okay? So the analytical redundancy is, is what is mostly used in practice. And there's different ways, there's qualitative approaches and quantitative approaches. Um, so, the, the, um, uh, so, the, so we have these two different approaches, so uh, qualitative and quantitative. The, um, uh, the other thing that is important, especially for large scale systems, is the, is the fact that when you have a large scale system, uh, you have options in terms of, you know, how do you process the information? If you, if you take all the information in a centralized way, um, uh, which is, has been the traditional way of doing things, um, there are uh, certain problems. And, and, and I think uh, when the systems were small scale and not interconnected, uh, maybe it was possible to do that. You can still do it now. However, uh, um, you know, there's uh, increased computational complexity. You have one algorithm that takes everything, you know, think of a, of a, of a power grid, being able to take all the information and process it and make sense out of it and being able to tell if something is wrong and be able to say where it's wrong, it's not, it's not an easy thing. Um, and, and so people have moved from um, centralized approaches to approaches that are actually non-centralized. And there are two approaches that are non-centralized. One is the decentralized architecture, and the other one is the distributed architecture. So in the, in the, in the decentralized architecture, we have an agent for each subsystem. So you know, this agent is responsible for this, this agent is responsible for this, this agent is responsible for this, but there's no communication between the agents. So this is, uh, this is the main difference. So we break up the system, but uh, because these uh, systems actually have, uh, they depend on each other, we're missing some information. Um, but we don't have, you know, we don't need to communicate. So we, maybe it's, it's more secure and, you know, and, and so on. So this is, the, the other approach is the distributed, which actually is a combination, it's a, it's a middle ground between decentralized and centralized, where actually, again, this agent is responsible for this system, subsystem, this agent for this one, but there is communication uh, uh, between, uh, and you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what type of communication, but I, you know, this distributed approach is, is in, in fact, it's one of the directions that the technology is, is moving because it has this, uh, and, and the type of communication, um, so you can have, uh, you know, between systems, you could have physical interconnections between systems, 
Uh, and then uh, the agents are usually uh, software agents and they exchange some information. They, they make uh, exchange, for example, the input and the output data that they have from the other system. Not everybody communicates with everybody. You know, so there's the concept of a neighbor. So those are the ones that, uh, uh, and or you can exchange estimations of the interconnected st states you can exchange for the fault signature or at a high level, you can exchange information about the decisions. This communication doesn't need to be continuous. Traditionally, people, you know, we develop algorithms for continuous communication, but over time, you know, that, you know that's, that's um, quite expensive in terms of communication overhead. And also it's, it's less secure and you don't really need to exchange information. So people move to uh, more, uh, you know, sporadic communication or even event-driven communication. So event-driven, you don't communicate unless something happens. For example, if, if, uh, if a certain value doesn't change, then you don't communicate that. So you only communicate uh, when there is a need to do, you know, whatever um, the application is. So event-driven communication. Um, so, the, so the motivation for distributed fault diagnosis is that you can handle large, more large-scale systems. It's more natural because the system is, is, is usually physically um, distributed and more interconnected. Uh, it's more scalable. So if, if you were to add a, a new component, you don't have to redesign the whole system from the beginning. You can just really, you know, design something for the new, a, for, for the new subsystem. So you add a new agent and you modify something in the neighbors, not everybody else. Uh, and it also makes it easier to isolate faults. Uh, and it also uh, matches with what is being developed in, in terms of distributed control. So let's look at, um, so let's look at, uh, uh, let's go into more detail in some of the uh, cyber physical systems and, 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 and see how, how these systems, you know, this fault diagnosis of cyber physical systems uh, looks like. And, uh, and then I'm going to give uh, some uh, uh, simulation examples at the end. So, so this, what we have here is we have um, the physical layer, a cyber layer, and this is a subsystem. This is another subsystem. These white arrows represent the physical interconnections, and each one of them is being monitored by an agent. So this agent is where the a control and the monitoring agent uh, are located. And these are com communicated with neighboring ones as well, depending on where the connections are. So if we were to look into one of these, um, into, in, into a single system, this is what it would look like. So we have the system, we have a sensor or a set of sensors, usually we have a lot. and. Uh, and, and then we have a, a monitoring agent and a controller, okay? And the controller uh, uh, has an actuator associated with it. Now, if, if we were to have, if one of the sensors were to become faulty and give re wrong information, not only is this information used by the local agent, the local controller and the local monitoring agent, but also it gets transmitted to the neighboring ones. And so, so wrong information gets, uh, gets uh, propagated. Um, and, 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 the, and the idea, okay, knowing that may, this may happen, and, and, and we cannot just assume that there's gonna be only one fault because it's possible that you have two or three. So you know, nowadays is we have such a large scale system um, uh, being able to, uh, so the idea is to be able to detect and isolate multiple faults that may occur in one or more of the cyber physical systems. And you can see because of the propagation, because of all these components, it's a difficult problem. So if we were to look at a nonlinear system, 
described by differential equations and where this is the this is the known local dynamics these are the interconnection dynamics and this is the uncertainty and, and uh, um, let's let's see what happens if some of the sensors become faulty so this describes the fault the fault of the system okay so we we have the measurement we have the noise and then a fault okay and the idea is to be able to um, uh, so that we have the, uh, the design of the controller. So we assume that this is already been designed. Yeah? And the idea is to be able to design. So the controller is already been designed and, you know, based on the, on the nominal, based on the healthy uh, system, which is the normal way that these are being done. And the idea is to be able to uh, detect and isolate multiple sensor faults and also to detect the propagation of faults. So in order to do that, let's look at how the monitoring agent uh, is gonna look like. So, so the monitoring agent, okay, this box, if we were to zoom in, what, do you, what we would see we, we, we would see something that looks something like this. So what we have is we need the analytical redundancy. So we have the information from the sensors and the actuators. And then we also have a, a model of the system, which of course is inaccurate. And of course there might be faults in the system as well. And we compare uh, a so-called residual error, which is the difference between um, what we are getting to what we think we should be getting, okay? And we compare this residual error to, uh, to a threshold, the, an adaptive threshold. So the adaptive threshold is generated based on the information about the uncertainty in the system, a bound on the uncertainty, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and, and if, if the residual is less than the threshold, the, the adaptive threshold, then we say that uh, there's no fault in the system. And if it, otherwise there's a fault. So, so there's two things. How do we design the residual based on the estimator? And how do we design the adaptive threshold? So the, the adaptive threshold is actually even though it looks very complicated, I'm not expecting um, uh, people to be able to see all the symbols. I just wanted to indicate that the design is actually, it's, it's a signal passed through a linear filter. So even though it looks very complicated, uh, but so the, the adaptive threshold is very important because if we, if we choose it to be too low, then we may, um, have false alarms, and if we use it, if we have it too high, then we may have missed uh, events. So this is this is the key component, and um, and and of course, what you have is you have many of these residuals and many of these thresholds. So you get a whole bunch of ones and zeros depending on whether certain thresholds have been exceeded, and based on that, you want to make a decision where you know, uh, if there's a fault, where are the faults, how many faults and, and so on. So this is, these are called, uh, so you need a decision logic, uh, which is based on this analytical redundancy relations. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through the details, I'm gonna give you a reference, but you know, for example, if we have something like this, uh, where we have three types of sensors, and we get this information, you know, you could have one sensor failing, the other sensor, or you could have two sensors failing and so on. So you have to consider all the different scenarios. And uh, if it's one, one, zero, then you can actually obtain a unique, uh, you know, that you have two faults. However, if you get, for example, one, 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 then you don't know exactly what happened but it gives you four different scenarios and, and you know that it's one of those scenarios. Okay, so this is the decision logic. So you have the design of the estimator, the decision logic, 
and and uh, and and based on this design, uh, we were actually able to show analytically uh, that this system, you know, the proposed system is actually being a, is robust. And uh, in other words, if neither the local sensor set nor the transmitted sensor information are affected by sensor fault then the set of analytical redundancy is always satisfied. In other words, we're not gonna have false alarms. And, um, and, and also the second result is if there's a time instant where the analytical redundancy is not satisfied, then there is, then, then the occurrence of at least one sense of fault is guaranteed, it's either local or propagated. It's important to note that this second result doesn't necessarily imply that if there is a fault, it would be detected, okay? It just is the opposite. If, if, it, if something is detected, that means it must be, there must be a fault either local or propagated. Uh, the reason is because in practice, uh, the reason that we cannot show that is because we cannot show that if there is a fault, it can be detected. It's because if the fault is actually in the range of the uncertainty, then it's not going to be detected. And, and the analysis shows that. Um, the other component that, um, that we did uh, work on is the learning approaches for fault diagnosis, where you you reduce the adaptive thresholds by using a learning techniques. So, and, and I'm not gonna go through the, because I'm running out of, of, uh, of time, I'm not gonna go through the details of this, but I'm providing uh, references. And, and if you have any questions, you can, you can send me an email so we, uh, on how to do this. Um, the other thing that is good to compare is, uh, Fault diagnosis versus cyber physical security. So in this presentation, I have focused on fault diagnosis. However, a lot of the things that I'm, I'm discussing can actually be used for cyber physical security. And this is an area that we are doing a lot of work these days. Um, uh, so intuitively, uh, you want to be able to distinguish between faults and cyber security. And, and how do you do that? And in the case of cyber attacks, it's, it's, it's not so important, um, you know, the accommodation part. Basically, you, don't, you just don't want to detect it as quickly as possible. So that's the early detection is a, is a key issue. And the other key issue is the sensor placement. Uh, where do you place the sensor so that you can actually make cyber physical attack detection as, as early as possible. So in, in, in some applications, for example, in a, in a, in a distributed water network, you may have you know, 10,000 nodes and you can only afford to buy um, 20 um, sensors for uh, contamination or for... So where do you place those 20 uh, sensors and, and uh, in order to maximize the ability to detect any contamination in the water. So that's a very uh, difficult and interesting problem that, uh, that we as well as other people are working on. So at the Geo Center of Excellence, we are working in several applications, um, for example, in, in water systems, in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems in, in contamination, um, event detection in buildings, um, in transportation systems, in smart camera networks, and in power system. In this uh, presentation, I'm just going to give some simulations with, um, I'm going to show some results with distributed fault diagnosis and fault tolerance control in HVAC system, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. So if we consider, if we consider um, a small heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, it consists of the rooms that, um, uh, that of course are interconnected because there might be doors or through the wall. And, and, the electromech and the electromechanical system that provides heating and, 
and cooling. Um, and so, uh, so being able to, if, if one of the sensors, and in fact, uh, one of the common ways that we lose energy is because of faulty sensors. It's very common um, to have faulty sensors. And how, how are we able to detect that? So, so let's, so in this, uh, in this simulation, we're gonna consider a seven zone system uh, with two sensor faults, one in zone one and one in zone seven. So overall, we're gonna have eight things to monitor with the seven uh, zones here and also the electromechanical system here. And, it, and you know, using the algorithms that I just mentioned, um, you can actually find, this is not only that there is uh, some sensor fault, but where these sensor fault are. And it's kind of important to note that without, without um, these algorithms, you wouldn't be able, so for example, if you look at which zones there is a tracking error. There is an error between what, what the temperature should be and what it is. You wouldn't be able to determine which are the faulty sensors because, for example, there is an error here. There's an error here in zone one, two, three, uh, four, six, and seven. Okay. Uh, so each one of them has a tracking error it's hard to, just by looking at it, at least for me, it's very hard to say which one it is or which two it is. Actually, there are two sensor faults, not five, not three, not one, uh, but we don't know which one it is because of the interconnections and so on. Uh, but uh, the, the idea is that these are actually the ones that are faulty and uh, this is what the algorithms uh, develop. And, and then we, I'm gonna show another, we did many, many experiments, simulations. Um, this is a, a large scale system. And uh, in this case, we uh, have an actuator fault in zone one and a sensor fault in, in zone three. And again, I'm, I'm not gonna show all of this because there's too many uh all the zones but uh, i'm just going to show um 13 of them and again you can see where you know you can see where the faults are so everything else is below below the threshold and then you can also distinguish that's the other thing you can distinguish between the actuator fault and the sensor fault and where it is so this is this is what we are doing here so um so in this case, you can identify that the fault is in zone one because, so after you detect, then you go to the isolation part. This is below the threshold while this one is exceeding. So this is, this is not the, where the fault is. And, 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 and same here, this, so this is in zone three. Um, so these are um, some more references for those of you that are interested uh, related to this work. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, where is intelligent monitoring control heading? So uh, of course, these are personal opinions, uh, but uh, for whatever is worth, I think things are uh, going into the direction of having more distributed monitoring and control algorithms instead of centralized. Uh, more cooperation between agents. Uh, we, because of the internet of things technology, we're gonna get more and more data. So machine learning, uh, so models combined with machine learning algorithms are gonna become a lot more important. We're gonna to have to deal with heterogeneous data. This is, uh, this is something that not a lot of work has been done. And more interaction between the monitoring and the control. In other words, if we know that some of the sensors are not working, but we don't know which ones, can we, 
can we uh, send some small signals in the control in order to help us identify where the faults are? Um, and, and this is, uh, so, and, and of course the issues of cyber physical security. Finally, I, I want to connect this work with a, a parallel set of work that is going on in the AI community related to safety of machine, of machine learning. And I think uh, this, you know, the, the, what, what we talked about today, which, which is an area with, uh, you know, with theoretical results and formulations and so on, are actually uh, very close to some of the things that are going on in, in the area of, uh, of safe AI. Um, uh, before closing, I, I would like to, to acknowledge, even though I'm presenting this, this is work that I'm doing with uh, several other people, uh, several colleagues, several uh, uh, postdocs or, or research associates, which uh, some of them are now faculty in other universities. And, uh, and, and, and so the ideas are not, uh, are not uh, only mine, but this is a uh, a team effort that over the years has been developed. So it's important to acknowledge uh, this collaboration and also to acknowledge the funding for this work, which is through the teaming project. And finally, I just wanted to mention that we recently started a new ERC synergy grant in the area of smart water systems, which is um, uh, somewhat related to this, you know, some of the aspects of here, but apply to, to water distribution systems. And um, so this, this just started. So uh, there are research opportunities for people that are, uh, have a good experience in machine learning or feedback systems that would like to apply these techniques to, uh, to developing the next generation of water uh, systems. So that's that's all I had, and, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer, uh, try to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Polikapu, for uh, your excellent presentation. The topic is indeed very interesting. Um, are there questions, please? Well, usually, you know, sometimes they- Put it in the, in the chat. I put my question, and some uh, years did. ago there was occupation with something called reliability of systems. That was okay. before the internet, before everything. And the question is, when we deal with data, <clears throat> people talk about cleaning and people talk about different things, and yet, in the end, it's a question is, is the data really reliable? So do you see a room for a new data reliability science? Yeah, um, if I understood the question, uh, so, I mean, um, Every, you know, not everything, but a lot of the things that I mentioned today is really related to the, so, so uh, I, I, I take one step back and say, where is the data coming from? And if the data is coming from sensors, which uh, are faulty, I mean, these are hardware devices that uh, give uh, wrong data. So that, that's one component. Uh, so, so a lot of times we want to understand not only if the data is reliable, but also if it's not reliable, uh, where is where is the problem? Because we, you know, if it's a sensor, or if it's an actuator, or if it's something else, then it's going to continue doing that. And, and I think it's very important to find the root of the problem. The other thing that I, I want to mention, which is, it's a you know the reliable. And sometimes the sensor is fine, but just we miss, uh, so we have some missing data. So, so I think this is, these, are, these are the key issues to, to what, uh, to what uh, so the reliability 
you know, you can think of the data reliability, you can think of the system reliabilities, and, you know, th this, uh, this thing goes by different names, but th the main thing is how are you able to detect, isolate, and, and design systems that are actually not just blindly taking data uh, and, and just using it. And, uh, and I think that's, that's uh, so uh, I, I think what, what you're talking about, I think fits, uh, fits very well with what uh, I have presented. I don't know if I understood the question. I'm sorry if I didn't. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll be in touch. Yeah. There is one more question in the chat. Could you please voice it up? The question is, uh, if you have any advice to students that want to work on cyber physical systems and what is the foundational knowledge that is required? Um, for cyber physical, uh, you mean doing intended to work on testing. So he's mentioned, or he or she is mentioning uh, testing or uh, testing cyber physical system. So um, uh, I don't know if, if they mean experimental work. Uh, so so at, at GEOS, we have several test beds where we try different things. So of course, you don't want to go to a power plant and inject the uh, faults in there. But what we, what we do, is we have a controlled environment where you know we um, we try to create either faults or attacks that are. As uh, sorry for interrupting you. I think the question is more on the theoretical side, which the is foundational, the foundational knowledge that is needed. For example, systems theory, and I don't know what else. Yeah. So what you? Yeah. So that's an easier question. So yeah. So the. What you need is you need background in in um, uh, signals and systems and 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 control and uh, and and of course uh, you know intelligent systems. You know if you're going to go into using some of these uh, machine learning algorithms, some knowledge there. But uh, yeah, so the the basic background that you need is. Uh, signals and systems, uh, you know, filtering, uh, um, um, uh, things like that, feedback control. Those are the, th these are usually undergraduate courses in, in electrical and, and also these days in mechanical engineering and things like that. But also, math mathemat you know, people from mathematics background usually can pick up this very quickly. Any other question, please? Uh, Professor Polikar, my question is, um, if you look at the physical layer and also in the cyber layer, you have nodes that are connected in a graph, okay? Uh, do you take into account graph topology in, uh, in your analysis or uh, the, uh, you know, don't work in this, uh, I mean, not only you, generally speaking? Yeah, so um, uh, that's a very good question, <laughs> and I, I think it's. Uh, I, I personally I don't work in in graph theory, but uh, but I I know some people that uh, are using graph theory for some. For example, uh, I, I could go back that you know when you when you look at at the system that you know the graph is uh, is. Uh, you know, so uh, especially a large scale system, you could, one of the things that, um, and, and this is kind of something that is kind of a, a wish uh, direction for me for quite some time, is how do you kind of be able to maybe zoom in in some of the things to look at something more closely or zoom out uh, using some graph theoretic approaches, but I haven't done any work on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. Uh, you know, in the past, we have done quite a lot of work on using graphs for signal processing. There is nowadays an entire area in signal processing, which is graph signal processing. And here I just see a two layer graph. You can have multi layer graphs as well. So mm -hmm. that could be a possibility for cooperation. So yeah, in the case of who knows? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. definitely. It's, uh, that would be great, actually. Is there, is there any other question, please? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, based on the uh, discussion or the topic on uh, test bed on how we can change a lot of things, make some controls. Can you can you please uh, complete that the explanation? I'm interested in in the trend of uh, uh, of research in that area. Yeah. So so for example, we have uh, so we have some. Some, you know, we have a test bed with a water distribution and system, not a very, you know, not a, a full version, but a, a, like a miniature one where we can inject like a, a type of faults in, in, in the pumps or in the sensors or, you know, uh, so we don't break the sensors, but, you know, we take the information from the sensors and add a bias and see how that is and whether that can be detected. And, and we have something similar um, with a power system test bed that we use, and, and we're in the process of developing something with, with a, a small cars as well. Now, when it comes to cyber attacks, uh, and we, uh, uh, you know, some of my colleagues are working in that area, uh, it's, it's more complicated to to do uh, because you, you in order to make it realistic you have to see you know how how usually cyber attacks are are being uh, incorporated because that's a big part of whether you can detect it or not and and uh, so but uh, you know it's good to have something to play with and you know try different different types of sensors different type of um, motors you know uh, whether they can be attacked and how that is uh, can be detected and isolated yeah thank you so much any other questions please if there are no more questions then i would like to thank professor policarpo for his very interesting talk this is the last uh, ida lecture in 2021 so i wish you Nice Christmas and New Year vacations. Okay. And uh, of course, we can join the lectures again starting January. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everybody.